Richard's talk has set up quite nicely um, what I'd like to talk to you about. So I'm an aquatic ecologist. Uh, my background is close to 20 years in industry, every industry you can think of, but a lot in the construction industry. Um, I spent 20 years at UVic as a research scientist academically. My background is oceanography, marine biology, aquatic ecology, and urban geography and resource management. Um, so what I would like to walk you through is what we've learned as ecologists about the way the planet actually works, how it functions, and how we can use that in the context of biomimicry or ecomimicry to rethink and reshape the cities and landscapes that we are going to inhabit in the next hundred years. So I'd like to start out by giving you a bit of the world that I see, how I think we actually got here to today, and then some of the challenges that we're going to face and why these might be relevant to Esquimalt. So it really is about urban design that functions like a forest, as Richard was saying. So I'd like to start out again. Um, Richard made an observation that I think is absolutely essential, <clears throat> particularly since I think all of us but one are Canadian. <laughs> so this large circle represents all of the water on the planet. That is the molecules of H2O, that's the total. Of that total, this white circle represents that portion that is fresh water. But it's important to recognize that we're a terrestrial creature and we're only interested in liquid fresh water. And of the total water on the planet, that little black dot represents all of the liquid fresh water on the planet. That is mostly, almost exclusively on the terrestrial environment. If we think about that, little tiny dot, which we're completely dependent upon, 25% of that is in Canada. <coughs> <laughs> That's just a little north of where he comes from. Another 25% is in one lake in eastern Siberia, and that's Lake Baikal. So 50% of the total liquid fresh water is controlled by 40 million people out of 7 billion. So water actually is turning out to be the resource of concern in the 21st century. Not the least of which, we often now hear that it is the new oil. Interestingly enough, if you talk to <coughs> political scientists, they will tell you that more than half of all of the wars in the planet right now are being fought over water. Which is true at a political level, but at a grassroots level, at a neighborhood level, what we're seeing is the opposite. We're actually seeing all kinds of communities coming together to figure out how they're going to manage this diminishing, declining resource, because if they don't, they'll both disappear. So if we think about the cities that we live in, they're actually all a 2,700-year-old basic design. And this was laid out by the Romans. The first is you have to have clean, fresh, abundant qualities of water into the city, and you need roads in order to bring other resources in, to take wastes out, and to administratively and militarily control your investment. These roads right here have been in constant use for 2,200 years, and you'll notice that there is a modern city at the end of that road. So you have a juxtaposition of ruins where people lived 2,200 years ago, and literally at the end of that road we have other people living. The problem is this model is no longer self-sustaining because it was based on a fundamental principle which worked extraordinarily well up until 1850. And that is resources in, wastes out. And the, if you want the proof of this, is literally in these two photographs. This is taken um, in 1910. This is Vancouver. This is an exact replica of that same photograph. You can actually see the landscape in the back are the same. You'll notice that this was taken in 2010, so you know this photograph is a lie because that was the Olympic, uh, Winter Olympics, and of course they had to Photoshop in the snow. <laughs> so we went from 1 billion in 
1900 to 7 billion a century later, and in less than a quarter of a century, we're going to go to 9 billion. The difference is, when we lived with only 1 billion on the planet, planet, very few of them lived in cities. Post-1950, virtually all of the new population, the last 3 billion, have moved into cities. And every one of these will now live in a city, and not one of those cities will be in the West. They won't be in Europe, and they won't be in Russia. They will all be in the developing world. And that means every one of these individuals is going to have to find a way to replicate what we've done, which is to bring in water, energy, to use natural capital or ecosystem resources in the context of not climate change, I prefer the term a changing climate, just reverse the two words. So if we think about the effect of what we've done over the last century, as Richard was talking about, Calgary's in the news again. This is the Bow River. Just look at that tree right there. That's the same tree right there. Every single ice field, every single glacier that we've looked at in North America is receding at an astounding rate. We don't need to go any further than that to know that we're in the presence of a fundamental change. These are the headwaters of the Bow River. Flooding is not going to continue to be an issue for Calgary. It's going to be droughts, and they're already thinking about this. The other two things that we've seen on the planet in the last decade or more are tremendous droughts. These are some of the fires in California. This is Hurricane Sandy. And if looking out at the age of most of the, most of the people in this audience, you may remember Houston, we have a problem. No, <laughs> Houston, you have a problem. So we are literally grappling with all of the changes on this planet because they all now have a direct influence on the Squamalt. So I'd like to argue that that's the legacy of the 20th, 20th century. So what are the challenges we're going to face in the 21st century? And I think they're really quite simple. They're literally about water, energy, natural capital, and by that I simply mean ecosystem services. Those microbes that Richard showed us in a slide that make up soil, not dirt, soil. And all of this adaptation to a changing climate with what some people call food security, which I prefer to call nutritional self-sufficiency. It's the ecologist in me. So let's take a look at how we actually got here. So the Roman goddess of sewers, Cloacina, from which we derive the term cloaca in chickens or poultry, you literally carried the waste out to the river. The term sewage is actually an English Anglo-Saxon term which means seaward. You get rid of your wastes into the sea. It's where the word sewage comes from. The solution to pollution is dilution. Albert Einstein pointed out in one of the three most famous papers published in the last century, the one in 1906. In that paper, he simply made the observation, the same kind of thinking that gave rise to the problem cannot be used to find its solution. In other words, the problem arose from a framework based on the way we looked at the world. And within that framework, there are problems that have no known solutions. But you don't need to worry about it because the problem is an artifact. It doesn't actually exist. If you change the framework with which you look at the world, the problem disappears because it was just an artifact of the way we used to look at the world. Yes. So a colleague of mine uh, in New Jersey has used this slide many times to point out why do we flush our toilets with drinking water? And how many of us would actually live in a house where we had to carry in the water, flush it, fill up the cistern, and flush it again? This is lunacy. Absolute lunacy. It is really about reclaimed water or water reuse. If we think about this in a slightly different context, using an American figure, which is roughly the same for Canada, 1,200 gallons per day per capita to operate the economy, less than 1% is actually consumed or drunk. And yet we use drinking water for virtually everything that we use in our cities. If we think about energy, here we are back in 1850, and we've moved dramatically in 150 years. 
and the amount of energy that we use and where we get it are unprecedented in terms of human um, habitation. If we think about this same time frame, just from 1970 out to 2025, remember 2020 is the deadline for getting our wastewater plants up and running, we can see that while there's a, an interesting pattern in how and where we get our energy, look at where that energy is going to be used in the future. It isn't going to be here. It's going to be in a lot of other places in the world. And I would argue, having spent time in most of these other places, they are literally grappling with what must their cities look like. And so I would argue that one of the great advantages of a place like Victoria, and that would include uh, Esquimalt West and Esquimalt East. <laughs> um, I'll be gentle. <clears throat> I didn't say you wouldn't be mayor. The farm city here. No, she's not. So I'm, I'm safe. I'm okay. Um, Victoria is a tabula rasa. It's a big blank sheet. And we have the opportunity to do anything we want, to literally use our community as a pilot project, as a demonstration project. And the greatest asset in the next 20 years is going to be knowledge and understanding and comprehension with respect to how do we deal with the challenges we're facing. And people will pay anything for that, as long as it works. So if we think about this energy model, it's only this tiny portion that's renewable, and that's the piece that we're really all here talking about. The part to remember, and Richard again uh, uh, had a slide on this, if we start at 100% of the energy produced, by the time we actually get to use it, it's a fraction of what we actually produced. So we're not only inefficient, we're not very effective at what we do. And the grid itself is in desperate need of, of rebuilding, but also rethinking. And the closer you move the energy production or its recapture to where you use it, the far more effective you're going to be. Something that most of us never think about is phosphorus. So if we think about the fact that I'm what stands between you and lunch, that is the nutritional break, then we need to think about the fact that almost all of the food that we consume today globally comes from industrial farming practices. There's not an awful lot that's produced by small um, plots, some in the third world, but in the, in the first world, for sure. This is a desert landscape, and it used to be, 2,000 years ago, one of the most verdant, rich, agriculturally productive areas on the planet. And it was mined to death by the Romans. Most of the food the Romans ate in Rome did not come from Italy, it came from North Africa. And you can literally go back and check some of the old um, Roman texts. If we think about this essential nutrient, which is the most important nutrient in terms of um, ecosystem services, that is soil productivity on the land, it's phosphorus. In the ocean, it's not. There's a surfeit of phosphorus, it's nitrogen depleted. So 95% of the phosphorus rock, which is where we get phosphorus from, is in Morocco, China, South Africa, Jordan, and Russia. There is virtually nothing in North America. So it's not just oil that uh, is going to be important. So one of the next challenges will be in actually recovering phosphorus. And if we think about 7 billion people, there are 70 billion livestock animals. So if we look at what's going on in the rest of the world, what we discover that in terms of food security, with just a two degree rise in temperature globally, India will lose about half, or sorry, a quarter of its food production. China, fully a third. <coughs> Iraq and Syria have already lost 33% of the grain production, and that's going down at an accelerating rate, in part because of their political uh, strife. Texas has lost 37% of its irrigated production, and that's now in rapid decline because they're using aquifer water to frack oil shale to get gas because gas is more valuable at the moment than their productivity. Kansas, 30% since 2010. We never see or hear any of this in the news. So I had one of my grad students go up and take this photo a couple of days ago. 
haven't heard from her since, but we did get the photo, so that's okay. Um, the question is, can we fix this? Because this is literally taken about 10 years ago, and every one of these dots is the light of a city or a town. And we're going to add 900 new dots, literally each the size of that one or that one. That's Seattle, that's Vancouver. Because that's what we're going to build in the next 25 years. So the question I'm asking is not can we fix it, do we have a choice? And I think literally Esquimalt and um, the West Shore have the potential to actually begin to help understand how to do this. So I would argue that what we really need is a cultural shift to go from this open linear model to a truly closed loop resource recovery model. We need to move from this old Roman linear to an integrated model. And we need to integrate ecology, economy and social equity. And you must have all three. The key is to use less energy at each step, extract the energy, which means we need less in terms of natural resources, and we produce less pollution. It really is about moving from a degenerative system design to a regenerative system design. So we need to regenerate what it is we've spent the last two or three thousand years destroying. To give you an example of what I mean, this actually turns out to be a really neat way of thinking about the world. First off, it's much simpler than we ever thought it would be. And um, what we've learned is it's actually way more profitable than doing it the old-fashioned way. This is conventional engineering. This is the old Roman word um, derived from the Latin ingenuum, from which we also derive the English word ingenious. So engineers are the purveyors and designers of ingenious devices. We did this for 2,000 plus years. Then Richard, Neilhouse, Richard Milhouse Nixon in 1970 introduced the NEPA legislation, that is the Environmental Protection Act, and produced the term environmental engineering. The problem is... The noun is engineering, and the modifier, the adjective, is environmental. We just need to reverse these two words, and it's literally about engineered ecology. Ecology is the noun, the modifier is engineering. These are three examples of stormwater or rainwater management taken within three blocks of each other in Saanich. So my question to you is very simple. Which one would you like to live beside? Um, this is one half of one of my graduate students, and I'll come back, uh, project, come back to that. So essentially, we are literally thinking about our cities and the role that water plays, and we really need to balance development and ecological stability. What we almost always ignore is everything below the macroscopic elements that we see. I'm a microbial ecologist. I spent most of my professional life looking down a microscope at the largest percentage of biomass on the planet, which is all microscopic. The big stuff like us actually are a relatively small percentage of what the planet has on it uh, in terms of biomass. The other thing that turns out to be really intriguing is we've been driven by a whole set of constructs which aren't wrong, they're just terribly incomplete. So this is the hydrological cycle that we've all learned in school, developed in the late 1700s in France. But let's just take a look at this little piece because it turns out we've missed something. This is the big blue water cycle, and as Richard pointed out, it's this green water cycle that turns out to be extremely important because it accounts for two-thirds of the way water moves around in the planet. This is only one-third, and we know almost nothing about this, and we certainly rarely include it in our design structures. So as we remove the vegetation, we end up with cities that are hydrologically uh, dysfunctional or non-functional. Another component of that, again, Richard touched on this, is this heat island effect. We generate all of this heat by bringing resources in, largely combusting them, and then we produce this profile. What we really want is this line to go straight across like this. So I want to walk you through a couple of projects that we've worked on over the last decade or so to show you that this isn't theory, it's actually quite simple. And it is literally about educating from a single site agricultural all the way up to education. So this is uh, in the Blenkinsop Valley. Um, Mount Doug would be just over here. This is uh, Ray Gailey's farm. There was an old ditch, and we wanted to replace that with a fully functional stream. It's about a kilometer long, and this is what it looked like in August. There's the ditch. Um, 
took a year to build this, and then this is what it looked like a decade later. If you go there now, and that's why I gave you a 2010 photograph, you can't see anything except vegetation. So none of the, this background is there, and you can see this power pylon, power pylon, power pylon. Look at the carbon that's being stored. There's a staggering amount of carbon that's being sequestered here, not to mention water quality is improved. It was actually quite profitable for the farmer to do this. I won't go into the details, but it was highly profitable to end up doing this. Um, this is an example of using the same principles to develop a subdivision. So we've gone from a small agricultural field, half a dozen cows for a couple of weeks, one hay crop, if you're lucky, two maybe if it's a really good year. Notice the flooding, this is all in the floodplain. We um, worked with a developer to build a subdivision. That's what it looked like in 2010. This is part of the rainwater management. That's what it looked like 18 months later. These are the houses. Interestingly enough, the developer had an autocentric view of the world. All of these houses face the road. If each house had been rotated to face the wetland, they would have added twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars per unit. He's never built a house that faces the road since. If he's got aquatic habitat adjacent, um, what's intriguing is the profit. Here's the old way of doing it: net negative cost to the municipality and to the developer by treating a liability as an asset. It was worth a million dollars extra profit. And that's without turning the houses around. So it really is, if we're going to scale this up to the scale we're now thinking about, is about all of the R's. Recognize, remember, renewable, regenerate, and real costs. So this is Dockside Green, a former brownfield site, lead platinum. It was actually only viable once we understood we had to integrate everything. So it was literally about building on-site wastewater, an energy plant, got some challenges with the energy plant, of course, but it was really about generating value. So this is not any longer about cost reduction. We can't get where we need to go if we just think about that. We need to be thinking about generating revenues. So here's an example of how we would go about doing that. And I don't, I think I actually brought two books just to give you a sense of, There's a small group of us around the world called the Smart, Glean, Smart, Clean, and Green Towns and Cities of the Future. We've been working since 2007, and these are two textbooks that literally came out of, you'll notice they both have Docs and Green in the front. And this came out of a think tank at uh, Wingspread uh, out of 2007, where a group of um, engineers and uh, planners, architects, lawyers, ecologists, were thinking about how do we go about literally celebrating water, regenerating ecosystem services, all based on a fundamentally new way of thinking about economics. So here's looking down on Dockside Green, here's the waterway, there's the wastewater treatment plant, there's Full Epi, the bakery, and this is literally what the waterway looked like in a year and a half. And so the houses that looked onto or were beside the waterway, all sold first. I think they were all sold in 120 minutes. And it was literally at a higher value because this is what you walk out on on a day like this at 8 o'clock in the morning with a cup of coffee in your hand. It's not paved asphalt. Uh, just for, so that you, you understand the design, because I'm not going to have time to go into this in detail, the treatment plant produces... Um, Reclaimed water, which meets the provincial standard under the municipal wastewater regulation. It's used for flushing toilets, uh, outside hose bibs. It actually is used on some of the roof gardens. And at the same time, any surplus to needs water is put into the head uh, of um, waters of this uh, greenway and it flows down, it's pumped back up. And at some point, if there's too much in the greenway, it overflows and goes out to the ocean. This is just an, an example, uh, and this is already about half again as much biomass this year. So again, this is about literally water and energy recovery cells. The, the concept of a wastewater treatment plant is a legacy of the 20th century and we really shouldn't be thinking of it in that sense. This is uh, Southeast Falls Creek. We were part of this design team. 
um, on both the public realm and the, the private realm. This is the athlete's village. And you can see this is where it's located. This is about a 75 acre site compared to about a 12 or 13 acre mm -hmm. site at Dockside Green. And this was the public realm keeping False Creek open to the public and then a private development on all of the other lands. The used to be a wastewater uh, sewage lift station right here. The, the wastes uh, from the city would flow into this uh, pumping station, pump it up over the ridge on Mount Pleasant and gravity feed out to Ion Island Treatment Plant. It needed to be rebuilt, it was completely worn out, so what we suggested was let's rebuild it, but we'll build it underneath the Canby Street Bridge where you can't build a building anyway. So essentially, the city or the province already owned the land, so no land cost. So you move it over to here, sell the site that you had before for development, and then this is simply a pumping station. We borrow the sewage for 60 seconds. We separate out the solids, we take the heat out of it, and then the heat is used for 15,000 units. And it's a, at the moment, it's a four to one ratio. For every unit of electrical energy in to operate the facility, we get 4.5 units of heat out. So the buildings on the site will only pay about 15 to 20% of any increased electrical energy costs. The site across the street that said they didn't want to be tied in and went for baseboard heaters, everybody that owns one of those units will pay 100% of the costs. And the real cost for electricity in BC will be known to all of us two months after the next election. <laughs> we also capture all of the rainwater on the site. That's not just from the roofs, but from all the piazzas and the platzels. It's stored on site and then it's used to flush uh, toilets and for outside um, irrigation. A large percentage of the buildings have both ex um, intensive and, and extensive green roofs. We also dug up a stormwater um, piping system that had been built in the 1870s. And this is literally the water coming from these hills and the surrounding sites flowing through this out into the ocean. And of course, at the end of this is uh, a man-made island that we built, um, required by DFO to compensate for taking out one of the most polluted sites I've ever seen in my life, which was underneath an old wooden dock. Um, when I was asked what I thought uh, with respect to how soon the ecology of this would come back, I was pretty confident we'd be guaranteed of something in 25 years. I thought it might be as fast as 10 years, because th this, of course, um, is, has an awful lot of pollution that was left intact from the old industrial days of Vancouver. It actually took 10 months. So within 10 months, we had a large community of macroscopic algae, seaweeds, and at the end of 10 months, the herring were spawning on the algae, which is where they spawn naturally, and the last time they'd spawned in Falls Creek was 75 years before. Two weeks later, we actually had a humpback whale in here for about seven or eight days, swimming around, and everybody was ecstatic, and I was really saddened because I think the only reason she was there is because she was deathly ill, and she didn't want to drown. So being a, 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 an air-breathing animal, when marine mammals get sick, if they can't keep coming to the surface to breathe, they drown, and oftentimes they beach themselves or go into shallows where they can keep their air hole up without actually exerting any energy. This is an example of an industrial complex in Montreal. Um, a fellow came over from Beirut and said, why don't you use these roofs? And the response was, well, we do. We store snow on them in the wintertime. <laughs> and um, we keep the rain out in the summertime. And he said, well, I think I should build greenhouses, which is what he did. And I think the ROI, the return on investment, is less than five years. And so within a two kilometer radius, people in this industrial capacity can come here and buy all of the fresh vegetables they need um, at very competitive prices. And this is literally a facility um, in the wintertime. Why would he do this? Because they used to vent all the heat. So he gets the heat essentially for free. This is downtown Vancouver, Stanley Park. This is the convention center. It has a wastewater treatment plant in the basement, and it has a green roof uh, on, this, um, on top. And here's just an example of the engineering concept diagram of how this facility works. And of course, they've got this lovely, cool ocean water 
unlike Esquimalt, which is miles and miles away from the ocean. Um, and of course, they can use this for both heating and cooling. In, Do in um, Southeast Falls Creek, we were not permitted to do this because we were told it was a navigable channel for rusty old sailboats, and we were not allowed to put any heating and cooling facilities uh, in the ocean. And as soon as it was built, they built a dock right where we would have put it so they could bring the little ferry boats in. Um, this is uh, Battery Park in New York. Uh, this, of course, was created from all of the fill from the Twin Towers, uh, which you notice aren't present. Um, a colleague of ours um, from Natural Systems Utilities in New Jersey was brought in to try to figure out how to address energy and water reduction in this particular facility. So it's about just under 300 uh, residential units. They were looking for substantial reductions in water use and wastewater because of the cost to the city of New York to bring more water in and get rid of their sewage. So here's um, literally looking down on Battery Park. This is just again ex an example of the distributed reuse uh, facilities. Somebody raised a question earlier and I added this slide. When they were building the building, they put all the water tanks in then so that they didn't have to try to shoehorn them in later. So knowing what you were going to do in terms of reuse and reclaimed and recycling, at the very beginning, you built all of this in to the engineering and the architecture at the very beginning. This is the Empire State Building, 1930s <coughs> building, um, marvelous piece of architecture. Um, but engineering uh, has let the um, HVAC systems and the heating and cooling is completely worn out, and they were looking at replacing it. And of course, the building owner said, well, I just need to replace what I got, but we'll do something a little bit more efficient. When they looked at literally converting this into a green building, so a retrofit, what they discovered was it was actually not only cheaper, but there was a huge revenue stream coming out the other end, and that only took less than three years wow. in actual fact. So the return on investment for retrofitting an existing building was fascinating, but the part that was coolest as far as I'm concerned was they had a heck of a time finding people who could do this because the knowledge base wasn't there. People were trained to do what they'd always done, and if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you always got. Only they didn't want that anymore. So what they discovered was they had to actually start training people. Well, now that they had a trained workforce, other building owners came and said, well, when you're done here, could, could I get you to just come over for the afternoon and look at my building? And so when you look at the number of jobs produced per billion dollars spent, look at the difference between producing coal and coal-fired facilities with simply retrofitting buildings, which is what Richard was talking about earlier. It's a huge increase in the job market. So around about the same time, this would be seven or eight years ago, um, I was in Southern California with a colleague from Natural Systems Utilities who built the Battery Park building. Um, we were looking at a project in Malibu um, for wastewater and the phone rang. And it was a local architect, Terry Williams, from Victoria, who said, where are you? I said, well, I'm in California. Excellent. Where in California? Well, just outside of Santa Barbara. Perfect. I need you to go to Palm Springs right away. Because there was a college called Palm Desert, uh, College of the Desert, and they were looking at building a brand new college to train people for the green economy. Just note the 10,000 windmills out here. So we spent five years um, developing uh, an entire program to build a campus. When I was asked to go there, it was because they had a water problem. It, something to do with the desert, I don't know. <laughs> and when we looked at what they were asking us, we said, well, actually, the problem isn't water. You have a design problem. You're going to build all these 20th century buildings in which to teach 21st century technology. This is lunacy. The campus is the curriculum. And that single sentence caused the university to change their direction, design the entire campus, every single aspect, from the pencil sharpener to the wastewater treatment plant, sorry, the water and energy recovery center, <laughs> within, with the view that anybody coming onto the campus 
would immediately know they were in, in, a, in a very different place. And the students would be the first students in the world to be trained and educated literally in a facility that would be of the kind they were going to design and build themselves. And then about eight weeks ago, they scrapped the whole thing. So we just heard that they decided to abandon this approach, and we have no idea what they're going to build now. A second facility was to be built four years later, and that one would focus on agriculture at the other end of the Cochilla Valley. So if we think about the, where we've come from and where we're going, if we go back to 1900, disease was the issue at the turn of the century. We'd only just literally understood about microbes, Louis Pasteur. We had an economic challenge in the 30s. We had a little event here in Europe somewhere in 1939 to 45. We had an agricultural revolution as we began to understand the need to produce food for a dramatically expanding population. In the 70s, we had an oil crisis, not an energy crisis. Here we are, about 2010, we have a freshwater challenge globally. Within less than a decade, we're going to actually be facing a wildlife challenge. And wildlife are all of those microbes and organisms over which we exert no control. Our control is over tame life. So wheat, penicillin, those are tame life. It's the soil microbes that Richard was talking about earlier that are the wildlife. And everything that we have that we're dependent upon is completely constrained by these two assets right here. And of course, by the time we have 9 billion people, food is going to be the single biggest challenge. So I'd like to just close by pointing out that Houston, you have a problem. We've seen the kinds of changes that are occurring. This is again Hurricane Sandy, the second major hurricane to hit the United States east or southern coast. Total cost to date around $250 billion in damage. And this is a game changer because if you're an insurance company executive and you're a banker, first off, I know the two of you know all about back rooms. <laughs> the second is you both drink scotch. And the third is, neither of you any longer have any interest in investing here. The banker isn't going to provide a loan or a mortgage because the insurance company won't insure it, because that is a risk that's not manageable. And this is happening literally all up and down the East Coast and the sou Southern Coast of the United States. The insurance companies are no longer writing a ton of policies. If you can't get a mortgage, then the asset that you used to own may be worthless which means you no longer are required to pay taxes, which means the mayor has a problem. Well, actually, his financial assistant does. <laughs> so I want to come back to something that Richard was talking about. This is literally the IPC model, the um, Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, or a changing climate, and this is the, the carbon cycling. It's not wrong, but there's a piece missing. And that piece literally misses the freshwater component of the planet. And here's the part that intrigues me because I'm a microbial ecologist. This is a little wetland over in Colwood. It's filled with nutrients and every year it produces a huge amount of, you know, that slimy, scuzzy, algal stuff. These little ponds make up about seven, or made 400 years ago, about 7% um, of the planet's terrestrial surface around about the year 1600. And the rate at which carbon is fixed here is 1,000 to 10,000 times the rate of trees, savannas, or jungles. Not double or triple, it's 1,000 to 10,000 times as fast. And it is stored, just as in the soils, it's stored in the muds. And so what we've done for six, sorry, five, 400 years from about 1,600 is to virtually wipe out all these small little ponds. And these are very small. Nothing that I'm talking about is more than two square kilometers. And so we don't actually understand how the landscapes that we live on, live on today function compared to what they were 400 years ago because they don't look at all the same and nor do they function the same. So not only have we gotten rid of the forests, as Richard said, and wiped out a huge percentage of the seaweed production in the oceans, most importantly, we've got rid of all of these. The state of Iowa, 
is arguably the most right-wing Republican state in the U.S. Union. They consider Texans to be communists. <laughs> they have wiped out virtually all of their wetlands. And a colleague of mine, who's a scientist from um, McGill, now teaching at the university, went to the legislature to point out that he couldn't understand why they were giving away three to four hundred million dollars of revenue every year. And of course they wanted to know which kind of an accountant he was talking about because they had no idea what he was talking about. And he said, well, every year all of the hunters and the fishermen and the recreationalists leave the state and go to adjacent states to recreate where they have wetlands. Oh. Well, how much would it cost to fix and rebuild all the wetlands? Oh, about 35 million a year for the next 20 years. Within two weeks, they would passed a law saying they're gonna rebuild their wetlands. He never said, this is about carbon or climate change or anything else. He just pointed out it was the revenue stream loss. So this literally may be another way, in addition to what Richard was saying, about how we actually resolve many of the kinds of challenges that we're facing. So if we're looking at these cities of the future, then it really is about understanding how to procure the innovation. It's not about the innovation, it's the actual procurement of it that really is the challenge. I would argue that we have met the enemy, and he is us. Good old Pogo got it right in the 70s. So it really is about understanding what's going on in the oceans. The climate of the planet, it turns out, is probably due almost entirely to single-celled phytoplankton that live in the ocean. They produce a little tiny compound, it's highly volatile, dimethyl sulfide, it goes up into the atmosphere, and it's the nucleus around which water vapor is produced. Why would they do that? Because without the cloud cover, they would probably burn, it would be, the light would be too intense and it would burn their photosynthetic structures. So there's a substantial amount of evidence that now suggests that much of the climate, not all of it, of course, is actually courtesy of this living process that goes on in the oceans. So if we go back to where we were in the early 60s, I would suggest we need a 21st century moonshot. Houston, we actually have a solution, and it's here in the West Shore. I think we need a regenerative economy in a new age of persuasion. And I'll leave it at that. Thank well you. Said. Thank you.